Uh, last year we had MTV here to present some of their very interesting research on how the social consumer was sort of evolving and how music played a role in consumerism. They're back this year with new research. They're going to show you how the new generation of consumers are embracing music almost in their own image. And as you hear this, think about how that relates to your customer and how they might have a relationship with you and your products in their image. So would you please help me welcome Allison Hillhouse, VP of Insights and Innovation at MTV. Thank you. Um, so today I'm here to talk about millennials and their relationship to music. Um, as many of you guys know, MTV is no longer officially music television, um, but music is still a very important um, part of our core identity. Um, we've been really fascinated with how millennials are approaching music and how they're really pushing a lot of transformation in the music industry. Um, you know, tearing down the walls, crushing the hierarchy, really demanding a very radically, audit, um, radically intimate relationship with artists. Um, so really seizing a lot of control. Um, the image that I've chosen here is, um, is anyone familiar with Dan Deacon? He's, a, he's an elect, EDM, electronic dance music artist. It's still probably a little niche right now. Um, but I thought this was a good uh, image because it really reflects what's going on in the, in the music industry with, with youth, um, that he's actually performing in the audience with his fans. And this is something that he does, and as you can tell, the millennials love it, and it really makes them feel like they're on the same level, that there's like the zero distance between artist and, and fan. Um, so our goal of this study, and we did a lot of different research from ethnographies to qual to quant to online diaries, is to understand the relationship millennials have to music through the stages of discovery, affinity, and advocacy. And starting with discovery, um, we found that um, discovery is a very active process for millennials say. They're not just sitting back and seeing what comes on the radio, but they're actually taking a very active and engaged role in discovering music. Um, and if you think about what this landscape looks like, there was a young woman in our study, Jenny, who's 22, and she said, I was just 10 years old when Napster hit. And if you think about the world she's grown up in, she's always had all of these tools to discover, to experience music. Um, you know, prior to that, you really had to sit around and wait um, for what would come on the radio. I can think back to when I was a kid, you know, you'd hear a song that you like on the radio, you'd run across the room and plus press record, and then every single cassette tape you had said something like, you know, 103.3, uh, more than words by extreme, or Rex in effect, rump shaker. Um, but, you know, millennials don't have to just sit and wait for the music to come to them. They actually have the opportunity to go out and discover and download and, uh, and find it themselves. And one of the hypotheses we went into the study um, with was that we felt like this might be really overwhelming, um, having all these different tools, having all these vehicles to get music. And uh, we were wrong. The answer was no. This actually makes us feel quite empowered. Um, and as Carolina puts it, um, I think the state of today's music is perfect for the diversity of our generation. I'm using my savviness, my resourcefulness to put together what I love, what's unique to me. So it's very much about coming up with your own personal brand identity, um, with uh, you know, creating your own unique music persona. Um, one of the things we constantly hear from young people is that they believe they have eclectic tastes. Everybody says, I have eclectic tastes. 85% um, say, among people my age, it's cooler to listen to a diverse range of music, not just one kind. And if you see at the bottom, that's um, taken from somebody's Facebook page, where they like Dave Matthews and Taylor Swift and Lil Wayne. Um, and as Christina says, today with technology, it's so much easier to be exposed to different genres. You know, you can find out about Etta James or the Beatles or um, Drake. You know, everything is available to you online. Still, by and large, the number one way that millennials discover music is through friends. Not surprising. So this is pretty timeless. But the way that they're doing that is a little bit different. It's, it's through social media. And um, this kid, Frankie, who's one of the go-to uh, sources for um, millennials and music, 
Um, really, you know, you brands, brands the hell out of his, his music expertise. He's got a blog, he's got a Tumblr, he's got, you know, Facebook, Twitter. So he really recognizes his role as being a friend dorser. Um, we also had millennials in our study uh, create music discovery maps about how they discover music. And they were all very different. Everybody had sort of their unique methodology for how they were learning about new music. And um, one of the, probably the starting place for most of them was Facebook. If you see that red arrow in the corner, um, you hear about something on Facebook. As Danny said, he's, then he might catch them on Spotify, Sirius, see if they're in a magazine, catch them in a concert, see them in a club. And at the very end of that whole chain, he said, if I really, really like them a lot, I might buy them on iTunes. So that's very different than the model of the past when you know, your first step in the process would be to either record something off the radio or, or buy a um, CD. So 81% say, I'm really good at using the right combination of digital tools to find the right music I like. So I don't find this overwhelming. I find it very empowering. This is another map that one of our millennials submitted to us. Um, the second phase in this, uh, in this music experience is the, is the phase of affinity. What happens when millennials are starting to develop an affinity for a particular artist or band? And um, one thing that we thought was really um, interesting was that they're really viewing the artist as a friend, um, and they really expect this very radical um, intimacy with the artist. For example, they expect Nick Jonas to share his favorite song or to share the fact that he just had a turkey sandwich. And it makes um, the artist feel much more down to earth, makes them feel more connected, and the more likely that a millennial is to engage within their, with their music. So 76% say I feel stronger connection to music musicians who are open about who they are. Um, musicians like Demi Lovato, who are talking openly about her um, eating disorders and her emotional issues. Um, you know, artists like, like uh, Nick Jonas, who are talking about everything that's going on in their day-to-day -day life. Um, they're also really demanding total interaction from artists. And uh, if you look at the visual on the right here, this is something that one of the millennials in our study drew. And she said, this is what I expect an artist today to be doing. I expect them to be sharing their music through Facebook, through Twitter, through texts, making playlists for me online. So it's really, um, you know, a lot is expected of an artist. And I think this quote is really funny. I always love it when millennials like speculate about what it was like back in the old days. She said, I think maybe 10 to 15 years ago, musicians made music to express themselves and then waited to see how people receive it. But today there's total interaction between the listeners and the music, like musicians. Like we're really expecting them to, to give stuff to us. Um, and then we found that buying music is really symbolic, um, symbolic patronage, um, because you have Napster, uh, well, it had Napster, Kaza, whatever site, whatever BitTorrent you're downloading music. So when you actually are purchasing music, it's out of respect for the artist. It's because you think that they're really brilliant. You think that you know you've really connected with them in social media. It's not so much because you feel like it's the right ethical thing to do. Um, so these stats support that. 68% say, because I believe um, music should be free, I'm only paying out of respect for the artist. And 81% say, when I feel closer to an artist, then I'm more likely to support that um, artist by purchasing music instead of downloading for free. So that's, that's when um, it you know, becomes necessary and important for me to buy music. We actually heard I just an album, uh, maybe it was a year or two ago now, Game of Thrones was a huge album that um, young people wanted to buy. And you think sometimes that it's the smaller indie artists that they're gonna support, but they're actually like, no, I think Kanye's brilliant. I really believe that I should support him through purchasing this album. Um, they also don't believe that there's any such thing as selling out. If anyone here is, um, you know, over 30, you felt like back in your day, if, if someone was, uh, you know, part of a commercial, put their song in a commercial, that they were a total sellout. But millennials don't feel that way. They say, you know, I understand artists have to make money, and I applaud them for doing that. Um, so if anyone's ever played on Rap Genius, this is a screen grab from Rap Genius. It's super fun. You can decode any rap song and find out what they're really saying. And here at the bottom it says, I've highlighted this one line, you should listen to my beat through my headphones. And Dre is promoting his headphones, which you've probably seen like all over New York City and every subway. Um, but he's not afraid to promote him, and it's, it's cool, and nobody's really thinking he's a sellout for that. Um, and the final stage is advocacy. What happens when millennials are going to become real advocates for an artist? 
Um, and first off, they consider themselves to be branding machines for an artist. And this is uh, a picture that one of the millennials drew and said, as your fan, I am really working hard for you. I'm publishing your music on Facebook. I'm sending it through my Blackberry. I'm emailing it. I'm um, listening it to my car. I'm using my iPod. And all of my friends are hearing it. So I'm really serving almost as your mini PR machine. And as Sarah said, I expect something in return for that. I'm working hard for you. When are you going to pay me back? Also recognizing, though, that it's a really symbiotic relationship. Um, you're also my branding machine as an artist. Um, you're helping me kind of create my personal brand in, um, in Facebook. You know, if I can post something, some content from you or a video, it's also helping me build up um, my persona amongst my friends. Um, an artist that does a really great job of this is Chameleonaire. I don't know if any of you are familiar with him, but he actually has gamified his um, fan club. And for uh, his fans who share stuff in social media, um, you can actually earn Chameleonaire coins and get real life prizes. So he really is recognizing the value of having his consumers as his mini PR machines and is rewarding them in return. Um, one thing that we also thought was interesting was um, we asked millennials to diagram out um, what a fan is like today. Someone who totally dislikes an artist to the spectrum of being a fan to being an ultimate fan. And we asked them, you know, what do, uh, what do people do at these different stages? How do they engage with an artist? And then we asked them to put themselves on this diagram um, thinking of their very favorite artists, where would they put themselves? And nobody put themselves as an ultimate fan. Um, and this is their very favorite artist. They said, well, I'm a little bit, little bit below that. And what that meant was, in the past, they felt like if you really gave up your whole self for an artist, you were almost, your personal brand was almost being like absorbed by this artist. And they did not like that idea. We picked this image. This is just a KISS fan back in the 70s who might have gone to a KISS show wearing all of the makeup and trying to completely embody the brand, the KISS brand. We know back in the day, you know, Super Stones fans or, or Dylan or, um, or the Beatles were like, that is my identity. But now millennials say, I don't want to be identified by any one particular thing. So um, this uh, young woman here, instead of you know, exactly copying Lady Gaga's outfit, she's created kind of her version of Lady Gaga's glasses. So Gaga's almost given her this self-expression toolkit by which she can express her personal brand. So it's very much viewed as what can the artist, how can the artist contribute to my personal brand versus um, being absorbed by the artist's brand. So it's a, it's a subtle shift from, from the past. Um, Jessica puts it well. She says, the way I see it, the attitude or culture surrounding a musician I love gives me ideas. But I'm the one who compiles these together. And I don't let any one thing shape who I am. We also have this guy, Mark, um, who we met in Florida. And he was a, a Gaga fan. Not an ultimate fan, but just a step down from that. And this is his outfit that he wore to a Lady Gaga concert. And he um, also expressed the sentiment that the way to put it is Gaga's relationship with her fan, fans is really a give and take. She uses us for inspiration. She provides us with the material of voice. So we're really keeping each other going. So again, it's the symbiotic relationship of we're helping each other build our own, our own brands. So um, at this point, I'm just going to roll a quick video um, that shares uh, what some of these, uh, some millennials talking about these themes that um, I just shared. People who know that they can just grab any song they want and throw it anywhere they like and share it with whoever they wish, they've begun to reintegrate music into their lives as a form of interpersonal communication. I want to share music with people and I want people to know what I'm doing because I want people to follow me because I want to brand myself. Now because there's so much more interaction between music listeners and musicians, artists are much more aware of who they're making music for. Nobody demands musical innovation of Lady Gaga. What people want is uh, a sense that the musical artist is almost a kind of avatar for them. Cascade, this DJ, was like, I'm gonna do a free show. He made a YouTube video about it. I swear to God, this happened. In the video, 
he used my, my, my comment from Facebook. He took a screenshot and like put it in the video. I instantly felt connected to him and I instantly felt like, holy shit, like he's listening to me. Buying is definitely symbolic. If you like an album enough, I feel like here's my $10 because I think you earned it. You can download a song, you can download a movie, but you can't yet download the artist, him or herself. So the closer you can get to the artist, the more you can establish a kind of chain of physical connection between the consumer and the artist, the more valuable that is. By understanding where they came from, what kind of got them there, I could, I could say that this artist, hands down, it's like, I, it's like I know them now. It's like I know they're my homie. I hate when people say that a band sells out just because they are getting mainstream. That's not selling out, they're, they're finally getting recognition and credit for it. You can call anyone a sellout. Um, that word means nothing to me because that word means making money. And um, cool, I'm down for that. If you can make an extra three mil selling headphones for your music, go for it. Technology, I think, has changed the way I personally discover music and how I interact. It's really crazy how this digital technology has taken music to a whole nother level. Music is always a reflection of what the mood of a society is and what the organizing principles of a society are. Music is a reflection of, but also an instrument of social change. So everything that happens on the macro scale happens in a miniature within the field of music. Right? There hasn't been a single major social or political event in human history that didn't have its musical analog. So um, just thinking a little bit about music in the past, separation from uh, fans and artists. Now they're you know, out there taking cell phone photos with their fans and trying to be as, as intimate as possible with fans. And I just wanted to leave you with a couple closing thoughts. Um, just to uh, explain a little bit what this image is, um, the, the EDM artist I mentioned earlier, Dan Deacon, has uh, created an app where uh, all of his fans can actually control the light show at his concert, which is pretty amazing. He's like basically given up like set design and light design to his fans. So thinking about that, some of the uh, thought starters, because um, these are applicable across different in industries, whether you work with co cosmetic brands in the cosmetic industry or the car industry, um, how do you recognize and reward the consumer as PR machine? Um, how to offer unprecedented intimacy with your brand? And how to collapse the hierarchy and give consumers control, which I know is an idea that everybody's been talking about for a long time, but it's interesting to think of in light of how the music industry has started to shift and will continue to shift um, with millennials and with Generation Z. So, thank you. <laughs>